Hi everyone, welcome to another weekly edition of Surprise Church Bismarck's Worship Anywhere broadcast. Whether you're watching online, on TV, or on Facebook, we're so glad that you're with us. And go ahead and uh, share, comment, like, subscribe, all those things you can do if you want to continue to get stuff that we share uh, if you're online. Before we do anything else though, please follow the text prompts to download our app where you can find a discussion guide that goes along with this message, uh, notes, you can get involved in a group, a team, whether you're local or at a distance, we want to make sure that you can get engaged and stay connected with, uh, with us at Surprise. And then finally, you can follow the text prompts as well that you'll see on the bottom of the screen too to take one step forward today in your connection and involvement. Uh, those are kind of simple shortcuts to, to get involved. Before we uh, go any further also, I want to help have your help checking in on Facebook for charity. If you go to Facebook and start a post, you can check into Surprise Church Bismarck on Facebook and you will help us provide days of school to kids in need. Every 10 check-ins provides a day of school for kids in need in partnership with Haiti Partners. So we're helping Haitian kids uh, at a time where they obviously they've had a lot of weather issues, earthquake issues, there's lots of problems down there and we're glad to do our part partnering with thousands of other churches that are also doing this. So together we're gonna make a huge impact for Haiti. So thanks for your help checking in and doing good. We also are coming right up to the registration deadline for our evolving marriage retreat. If you have not yet done this, or if you know anybody who has uh, could benefit from a little jolt of joy in their relationship, whether they're serious, dating, or married, or engaged, any of those would fit this evolving marriage retreat. Don't have to be married. I want to challenge you to, to register right now at evolvingmarriage.net. Don't miss this deadline. We got to get the numbers to our caterer soon. It's $95 and that covers three meals, materials, the rent for the amazing Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center up in Washburn, a gorgeous setting. But if finances are an issue, there's also a scholarship request. We don't want finances to be a barrier for anyone. So evolvingmarriage.net, go there today, share that link with someone you know whether they live close or far away, this is worth it. We've had couples come away and say, our marriage has transformed. We say, don't go to change your spouse, go to change your marriage. Go to help yourself and your marriage. It's not about changing others, it's about growing and changing our marriages. So, evolvingmarriage.net, don't miss that. We're in a series right now called Unify. Check out this preview and then we're gonna dive into this week's message. This fall, we're talking about the critical things that help us as a church unite so that we can make Bismarck and all of the cities in which we live a better place to live that's more in love with God and his mission for the world. And last week, we, we informed you that you unknowingly were a part of our two-week starting line class at Surprise. We decided instead of doing that as a sidebar class, we're making that our focus for these first two weeks of fall. Last week's product, we talked about the prodigal son and what it looks like to have a church full of the good older brother that was not a part of the story Jesus told about the prodigal son in Luke 15. Go back and check that message out. You won't be behind today if you don't, but it's gonna be super helpful for you to better understand the big picture vision of why we started Surprise Church a couple years ago or seven years ago to be specific. Today is what that vision looks like in real time, what it looks like for you and for me to be a part of a church that changes lives on the inside and transforms neighborhoods on the outside in cities. And so the hint I wanna offer you is that it's all about relationships. And that is not a cliche. It's really truly what we believe is missing and what the Church of Jesus can provide to the world. Uh, and and th th this is based on two assumptions, I, I need to say. The first assumption is normal relationships are essential but insufficient. It's not enough to have good buddies, okay? You might have people that you can drink a beer with. You might have friends you can go out to a party with. You might have people that you can call when you're frustrated. That's good and we need that. We need parents, coaches, teachers, friends, and neighbors. You need to help from your neighbor when you're gone. We were out of town and our dog was going nuts. We had our neighbor come and they ended up cleaning up dog dew on the ground. That's a good neighbor, good friends. We need that, but it's insufficient in some ways too. There's a depth in terms of our relationships that most normal relationships just are not welcomed to. 
it takes a certain kind of effort and work and awareness of a deeper kind of relationship that all of us need, but few of us have. Normal relationships are essential, but insufficient. The second assumption is this, people fear spiritual relationships, the deepest kind of relationships, because they seem overwhelming and they seem mysterious. You might be, have, have seen weirdos or people freak others out with judgmental comments, forced intimacy, manipulation, cult behavior, but those are not the things we're talking about when we talk about spiritual relationships. We're talking about relationships that are difficult to cultivate because very few of us know how, but when you have them, you finally realize what you've been missing. So those two assumptions are going to be in the backdrop as we go into what it looks like to be a part of an older brother church, a good, life-changing church in real time. And, and, and I want to just ask you this question, just to think about in your own life, who has the authority to speak into your doubts, your sins, faith, fears, lifestyle, ambitions? Who in your life, even think of the people that are close to you, has the awareness of what's going on in those areas and the invitation to simply come alongside you and say, how can I help? Here's what I'm seeing. How can I pray? And I believe that there's a gigantic poverty even in churches of people who have that authority and that ability and that invitation. And when we lack that, we truly are starving in a spiritual manner because we're doing without something that Jesus died for us to have. I want to take a look at a story that Jesus illustrates the power of spiritual relationships in a way that there is no substitute. Now, watch this story. It's a story I've told before as we have shared our mission at Surprise and our vision for how to change lives. Um, it's a story in Luke chapter 7 when Jesus is on his way to the city of Nain, L-A-N-A-I-N. So just check in starting at verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And another large crowd from the town was with her. So here we have this interesting collision of Jesus and a large crowd of Jesus people walking to Nain and as they get close to the town gate another crowd another large crowd a funeral procession a, a death crowd as I'll call it today is coming out of the city and we get to watch what happens when these two crowds meet how different they truly are one of my friends that I would consider one of my spiritual friends of deepest relationships that I have uh, was talking to me about a, a, his, his past relationships before he came to Surprise and got involved in some of our, our community groups. He said, you know, I have had a lot of friends in my life, but he said, one of my friends I thought was a really good close friend and I was going through some really difficult personal, personal issues and I, I got together with him and I started sharing them with this friend because I thought he wouldn't care and want to know. And I got done sharing and he got a, and kind of an angry look on his face. He looked overwhelmed, flooded, confused, like, I don't know what to do, and he just panicked, and he said, don't bring that blank to me. In other words, that's not the kind of friend I am to you. Normal friends are overwhelmed by the most important things you're going to face. If you just hope that kind of casual, baseline friendships are going to carry you through the worst of life, you're probably going to be disappointed because those relationships are not equipped to bear the weight of things like loss and death and sin and grief and depression and despair. They're not equipped to bear those things. They might be equipped to enjoy some of the things that you can enjoy, to celebrate some of the good things in life. They're not equipped to bear some of the worst. Um, and I think Jesus came to earth because of the poverty of spiritual relationships that are available when we need them most. So here we have the Jesus crowd on the one hand, walking to Nain, and we have the death crowd, on the other hand, 
coming out of Nain, and we have this intersection that's going to happen. And it's almost like you look one way down the highway and you see a great big 18-wheeler, and then you look that way down the highway, you see another giant 18-wheeler, and you're like, ooh, this is going to be messy, or what's going to happen, or is it a game of chicken? Who's going to turn off the road first? Like, what, something's got to give, right? What's going to happen? Well, if, 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 if you're on the, the road and a funeral procession comes by, you probably pull over. If you, you're watching someone walk past you with extreme loss, you, you know, a, a normal casual friend, they might remove their hat, they might bow their head, they might offer respect, they might say, I'm sorry. But Jesus offers a kind of relationship that moves past pleasantries and that doesn't seem powerless. Luke 7, verse 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. He was moved with compassion, in other words, and he said, don't cry. Now, that's a bold thing to say at a funeral, right? Like, if you say don't cry at a funeral, you better have a good reason for saying that because that's mean. Crying is good at a funeral. I tell that all the time to families who are grieving. You have to let the emotion out. You have to mourn. You have to grieve. It's good. But Jesus tells her not to cry, not because her pain isn't real. It said he felt her pain. The word that says his heart went out to her comes from a word that means his guts were moved with compassion. So he feels the pain. He sees the pain. But he says don't cry because of what he's about to do next. He seems to think that he and his crew have the authority to confront the biggest issues of life and death. He seems to have this belief, as we watch him in the story, that, that even this situation, even the worst, most challenging, painful situations in life are something that he's got some sort of, of thing to do with. He's got some answer or antidote, or at the very least, he doesn't cut and run when those moments come. He's right there and he confronts them. He and his crowd. Luke 7 goes on, then he went up and touched the bier, the, 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 the funeral casket that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. Now, this was a no-no. You don't touch dead bodies and all that stuff. Like you, You're unclean and you'd have to go through a period of purification back then if you touched this, literally, this dead boy. But Jesus doesn't seem to care about the conventions. He's not a normal friend. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. The mother's life was just as restored as the young boy's because she, at that time, you don't have an insurance policy, you don't have a retirement account, you have a husband and a son. She was a widow. She had no more husband to care for her in her old age, and her only son was dead. She, had, she was going to be a beggar for the rest of her life. She had no options but, but hoping upon the charity of others. But Jesus gave her life back by giving her son his life back. This was a community miracle, not just an individual miracle. Now watch what happens next, because this is the point of the story. The point is not, hey, whenever anyone is sick and, or dying or dead, Jesus will always come and fix it. He doesn't empty out hospitals. He doesn't go to graveyards and just wave his hand and everybody comes out of their graves. That's, that's not the point of this story. The point isn't that people shouldn't get sick if they have faith or people shouldn't die if they have faith. There's a much, much more important point that this story is written to convey. Verse 16 shows the point. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. I have a question for you. Look at that. Look at that verse. Who is all? Who is all? Is it just the Jesus crowd? Is it just the funeral crowd? The death crowd? Well, I think the most literal interpretation is the best here. All means all. Everyone in both crowds, all, everyone, gathers around Jesus and praises him, worships him, thanks him, lauds him, and, and declares that he's a great prophet, that he is something amazing, that, he, that God himself has come. They're basically screaming that Jesus is God, all gathered around him. So do you know what just happened? Do you know what just happened? Jesus just played Pac-Man. You see, the one crowd enveloped 
the other. You know Pac-Man? Have you ever played that video game? The Jesus crowd just got bigger. It gobbled up a crowd that was oriented around death and by speaking into that situation and bringing his life and presence into that situation, the death crowd became a part of the life crowd and by the end of the story, all of them, all of them, all of them are gathered around Jesus as the Jesus crowd praising him and praising God. That's what happens when people gather spiritually around Jesus. It's a different kind of relationship. It's a different kind of friendship. And here's the last verse of this passage of Scripture, (laughs) as you see the Pac-Man image. This news about Jesus, not just any news, this story, this news about what Jesus did to this boy and for this mom, to this death crowd outside of this city, this news about Jesus spread throughout the... throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Pac-Man kept on eating. (laughs) He kept going around the corners and gobbling up other dark places and difficult situations. More and more people heard about this God and this story because they needed to hear it and they wanted to hear it and they sought him out as the one that they'd been searching for and longing for. And they didn't just seek Jesus out. They wanted to be part of the crowd. Eventually, Jesus ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God, and he left the crowd behind to continue to gobble up sin, death, and the power of the devil, to to be able to push back darkness, to be able to confront death, depression, and despair head on and expand his family and expand his reach. That's what we do at Surprise. You want to know what we do in real time to realize our vision to be a community of good older brothers? We have community groups. That's what we do. And in community groups, it's very, very simple. If you're virtual, you don't obviously share a meal, although you can have a meal while sitting there on Zoom and do a virtual group that way. But for in-person groups, we get together. Everybody brings one ingredient of a meal, unless they're doing a coffee shop kind of thing or dessert. And everybody, you know, put the burger bar together. Boom. It's the easiest meal of the week. We all file through. We get our plates of food. We sit down. We eat. We talk about life. We build real relationships. But we don't stop at the social. We don't stop at the casual, the surface level, we also digest the weekly messages. This talk right here, we digest that. We answer questions that are right now in our study guide and on our Worship Anywhere page on our website. And there are no experts because everybody has seen the same sermon. We're just talking about a movie or a message that we've all heard. Nobody comes to the group as the expert. Nobody feels like the dumb one who doesn't know enough. We all hear the message. We all look at the questions in advance, and we even challenge people to write an answer down for the questions so that when we have a discussion after dinner, it's deep. People have thought about this. They've dreamed about it. They've wondered about it. They've helped to digest it. And then they have something to offer the group that really is unique because it's filtered through their life and their experience. And we all need that. The reason Jesus gathered a group together was no one person is able to to help someone else know God. I can show you one part of God's beauty because I'm just one human being. And in a community group, you get to experience God through the experience and prayer and mind of of a multitude of people. And that is really, truly what, what helps us to grow in our faith. So we share a meal, we build real relationships, we talk about our weekly messages, no experts, everyone just shares their own experience and their answers to questions. And then we work to truly be there for one another. Over this past summer, we had a number of very heavy situations happen in our church and we're still in the middle of some of those. And I'll be, I was just amazed to watch that in, in each of those situations, the person was a part of a community group and the community group just came around them and gobbled up the darkness. Didn't take the problem away, couldn't pretend to be God, but declared God's power, believed that they had authority to speak into their situation and offer words of hope and encouragement, helped however they could, and truly be there for one another. And when people have been on the receiving end of that, they realize the difference between Jesus' crowd and other crowds that we surround ourselves with, between spiritual relationships and just normal relationships that oftentimes just get overwhelmed when life gets really challenging and don't know how to offer, never been trained to figure out how to minister to one another and encourage. And they don't have a team of people that are able to do it with them. You want to feel overwhelmed? Try to help someone who is dying or hurting all by yourself. Just try it. 
It'll last about a week and you're going to be overwhelmed. But in the community group, everyone bands together. I'll take the kids this day. I'll give a ride that day. We'll bring a meal this day. You bring a meal that day. Whatever we can do, we'll each take our turn. And that's a beautiful thing to see because everyone at some point is going to need that kind of love and prayer and support. And that's why number four groups grow. They just keep gobbling. I mean, people uh, in the very beginning found uh, the church to be the place that they were really looking for. Women felt more treated like human beings rather than some sort of property. Children, the same way, were, were valued in the church of Jesus because that's the kind of crowd he built. People have been hurt by Christians and church crowds who got it wrong, don't get me wrong. But when the Jesus crowd gets it right, it's an absolute thing of beauty. So I want to ask you to take a second. Decide which group you want to be a part of. And if you're watching from a distance today, you can be a part of a virtual group. Uh, we have a Sunday night virtual group that we'll be meeting. We have uh, a, a welcome team group and friends that meets Thursday night. So if you're working, traveling, or watching from Brazil or Texas or Minnesota, I want to encourage you to, to, if you have a physical uh, handout, uh, you know, you're, you're watching or you're going to be there on Sundays, you can fill out the physical handout you see there, or just text the word groups to that number. And we will help you get connected either to a virtual group or to an in-person group. We don't want you to miss out on what God is doing. Uh, we have a video that we're going to be showing this Sunday. I'm not sure we're going to have time in this weekly broadcast to, to share a story of JR. Uh, and his experience in community groups. But if you go to our surprisechurch.com website and click on testimonials, you're gonna see a number of stories of people who have experienced a surprise difference, who've experienced life change at Surprise and in community groups. So I wanna encourage you just to look those over and see the power of Jesus community. Not just normal relationships, but Jesus relationships. In closing, just wanna ask if you've noticed the death crowd lately coming down the road. Maybe you've seen it as you've surfed through the internet and checked out news sites or read the newspaper. Maybe you've seen it as you've talked to friends about what's going on and the pain and the anger and the loss and the division that's all around us. That, that crowd's growing too. That crowd's getting bigger and it's sort of invading. That, that darkness is sort of invading and we have an answer to it together. We have an answer that uh, Together, we have Jesus' authority to walk right up to it and say, don't cry. We've got something so much better than the division people are choosing, the despair that people are feeling, the hopelessness that people are enduring. We have the answer. His name is Jesus. We're connected to him and to one another, and we want more people to experience that joy, power, and freedom. You can't do it alone. Go ahead and try. You can't do it with just normal relationships. You need another gear, a deeper level. And I pray that God inspires you to push past that fear of intimacy and accountability that comes from being a part of the Jesus crowd. Can't wait to walk this journey with you. Thanks for watching this week. God bless you. I got involved with uh, community groups about three years ago now. I needed more understanding of the Bible and originally I joined a community group thinking it was kind of like a Bible study um, and I quickly realized that it was just so much more than that. You really develop those relationships and, and you have that core people that are, are there to help you out in good times and bad. Um, you know, and we just really feed off of each other and, and as that, our relationship has grown um, you know, it's, it's just come full circle for me, really. Um, just this last year when my stepdad passed away, the, um, the way the community group just really stepped up to not only help out with the memorial, um, but really let me lean on him and talk to him and, and just let me pour my heart out to him and how he felt to me and what he meant to me as I grew up through my whole life. So I think the biggest change that I've seen in being involved is I was very hesitant to try and contribute because I just, I came into Surprise Church in the community group knowing very little. Um, you know, I, I knew I was a Christian, but but I wasn't a practicing Christian. Um, and I felt I didn't have anything to contribute because I didn't know a lot of the stories of the Bible and, and, and things like that. Um, and what I've learned is it's not 
so much about learning the stories of the Bible, but um, just listening and how you apply them to your life and and, um, and, and the wise words that uh, are given to you that you utilize them. I think that is the biggest thing um, that has helped me is, is I've learned that I can contribute um, even though I, I still don't know, you know, <laughs> a whole lot of the Bible. Um, I, I feel comfortable in in our discussions that I, I'm able to utilize my life experiences and, and, and what I've learned just in the past couple of years um, and, and provide that, that knowledge um, to, to our core group. When I first started in the community groups, um, I, I, I listened, I was like a sponge. Um, I, I, I tend to process a lot internally before I, I want my answer to be just right and, and get it out there and, and uh, make sure I don't make a fool of myself. And um, so I listened for a very long time. Um, and as I, I grew and I listened to the people around me and um, realized that I'm not the only one in, I'm not the only one feeling the way that I do in that uh, I don't, don't feel that I have a whole lot to contribute, but all of us as a collective can contribute a lot to each other. Um, so it's just coming to that everybody coming together to look out for each other. And um, as I grew comfortable with that in my knowledge, you know, I, I felt compelled to to step up and and, and uh, just contribute more. And so as, as we've gone from session to session, um, I you know just felt that you know right now is the time for me to step up and and. Um, and, and lead the group and, and see how we do with that. With, with our new semester starting and, and people being hesitant to try new things and, and, and um, not wanting to put themselves out there, it's okay just to join the group and, and listen as I did and, and really just internalize process everything and, and it's okay not to, not to jump in and, and answer the questions um, on a weekly basis, but just sit there and, and actively listen to them and, and you will gain knowledge and, and um, you'll have a good time getting to know a new group of people.